Hey you, what's going on everybody? Justin here, and in this video, it's going to be, I promise, the last of my best of 2018 type of videos where I take a genre or a category of books that I read in 2018 and pick my favorites from that year. Because I do realize now it's June, it's like the, almost the middle of June of 2019 and I'm still doing my best of 2018 videos. Uh, man, I was thinking by the time I actually finished it, it's going to be almost 2020 and we're going to be, well, even at this point where it's only going to be like, what, six or seven months and then I'm going to be starting the process over again with this year's videos in 2020. So I probably should just uh, get going, wrap, wrapping this up. And I kind of thought about not doing this video and I was like, yeah, what the hell, I might as well <laughs> just throw this one out, especially since classical history is my favorite um, era of history to read about. But I really was just sort of overall, I, I don't know if I was disappointed, but nothing really, not much actually really stood out last year from my um, classical Greco-Roman reads or um, anything that took place kind of on the periphery of the classical world, you know, like the Celts or the, like the Germanic peoples or uh, like the Parthians, anything like that, the Hellenistic age sort of in general just didn't do very well reading wise. Uh, previously, that was, this type of history was at minimum 50% of what I was reading, probably closer to like two thirds of my reading was just classical era history, essentially from about 600 BC to uh, maybe like say 480 uh, in the uh, late Roman Empire. So. Yeah, it's kind of disappointing, like, realizing I didn't find that many great books on the period last year, or at least that I actually got down to reading and finishing. So I do, I am going to ask you guys for recommendations on classical uh, era history books, if you know any, or at least some authors, things like that, that you've enjoyed in the past that you've read before. Do you think I might like, um, like I said, this is my favorite period of history to read about, and I just... I haven't been having great luck. I mean, I found some, and actually I found a couple, I've read a couple this year that I've enjoyed so far, but I definitely need a lot more. Most of my library, what's left are kind of like, just sort of either my favorites or just sort of scholarly, like monograph, really like dry academic type works that, even though I like them, it's not like, you know, it doesn't make for ex like just really good, exciting classical history reading. So I am gonna ask you guys for recommendations if you, have any on the subject. So let's uh, just get to it. I only have three books that are even worth mentioning, I guess, in my opinion, from classical history. The sad thing is, I, I think they're all Roman books too. There's not even a Greek one. Um, and even, I would say, even before Greek history kind of edged out Roman history a little bit for me uh, earlier on, especially like in my college days and stuff. So it's kind of sad, uh, kind of realize, realizing I guess two are Roman, and then one's kind of Roman, and you'll uh, see what I mean. But let's just uh, get started with the three books. Right, the first one we're going to go with is The Gladiators by Fic uh, Mayer, or Major. Not exactly how you pronounce it. I think it's, um, I want to say it's, uh, he's a Dutch professor, and this is a translated work. Uh, but it's The Gladiators, History's Most Deadly Sport. And the reason I enjoyed this one so much is even though it really wasn't a five star read per se, uh, what it what what it is is it's just a great topical history uh, work. It's not too academic. Um, it doesn't get bogged down and doesn't kind of turn over every single stone and go through the weeds on every sort of arcane or esoteric topic that definitely uh, could be addressed. However, it's not just a completely dumbed down popular history work either. It takes a very good sort of golden mean middle road to its approach uh, with everything one would want to know about Gladiators. And I thought a fun part of the book was he does kind of go uh, into the movie Gladiator and kind of dispel, like, goes through the movie where some of the, uh, busts some myths and also, but confirms some things that they actually got right and everything. So I thought it was pretty cool um, doing things like that. But like I said, it is scholarly um, to a, like a good extent. He does go over all the different fighting styles of gla the different gladiatorial combat styles that we know about sort of how uh, a day at the arena would go for a gladiator for spectators things like that i just thought it was really fun sort of all the gambling involved the free like you know 
pri not prizes, but just sort of like the free uh, bounties that people would get just for like showing up and how you had to sort of win a lottery sometimes. Because uh, people do got to remember like the Colosseum um, in Rome probably could only hold, I can't remember if that's around 50 or 60,000 people, which even though that's a gigantic number, uh, the city of Rome at some points was easily a million people. So not everyone could just like show up on a gladiatorial uh, event, even if they wanted to. So it was kind of interesting seeing how there was sort of like a lottery event going on. Also how they sort of sprayed down the fans sometimes with like these giant like water fan type things to keep people cool and everything. I thought that was kind of an interesting little tidbit. And it goes through all the different kind of things that a gladiatorial event could have uh, besides just um, gladiatorial combat. But, and what was interesting too is he went through the different fighting styles and which ones would normally be paired up on like a regular um, fighting day and stuff. But also the different kind of uh, like prisoner executions, the sort of uh, fights against wild beasts, and even like the giant like psychotic like naval battles, like especially like under like Nero and stuff, where it was just insanity at its finest essentially. So yeah, like I said, it's just a really good blend of popular history, academic history into one work on just a really interesting topic, sort of, in general. So that's why I went with The Gladiators by Fick Major. Alright, the next one up is kind of a biography, kind of, it's partly biography and then part just regular history, and it's The Death of Caesar by Barry Strauss. And what this book does is it covers sort of the last sort of few days um, of Julius Caesar before he's assassinated, then there's a pretty good coverage of the assassination as well as sort of the aftermath of the assassination and sort of the beginning of the uh, Roman Civil War that uh, followed. And what I did like about this one, it's kind of like in a similar sense in that it's, it's definitely more popular history per se, but it's very readable. Uh, but he does make really, really good sort of arguments for the read, or he makes really good arguments to support his positions on why certain things happened. Uh, for example, why uh, the conspiracy sort of took place at this particular time in history in 44 BC, uh, things like that. I think that was really good. I do have a full book review of this. Yeah, I have a full book review of the Death of Caesar. I'll leave a card in the corner or something if I remember to put it in when I'm editing and all that stuff. Um, like I said, I did highly enjoy this one. I did give it four and a half out of five stars. If you guys love reading like biographies uh, on ancient history, this would be a really good one to pick up in that it's a biography and part. It's got a lot of biographical elements, but it's not just like a straight up biography. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So if you enjoy reading about the fall of the Republic, you really enjoy reading about Julius Caesar, uh, things like that. I think you really enjoy this book. I will say the highlight of the book is death. I definitely learned a lot more about sort of the aftermath of sort of the conspiracy right after uh, Julius Caesar was assassinated. I think that was just uh, really enlightening, seeing the kind of uh, like a day by day sort of progression of um, how the conspiracy sort of not unraveled because it's it was already kind of I don't know it's not really the conspiracy at that point but how sort of the revolutionaries like how it kind of just sort of fell apart uh, while uh, Antony and uh, what was left of the Republic kind of fought against uh, the conspirators uh, like Brutus and the other uh, Cassius and the other conspirators such as I uh, like the Battle of Philippi and stuff so I thought that was really cool and like I said I think I gave it four and a half out of five stars and I highly encourage you guys to check this out if you're interested in reading about the death of Caesar or the absolute fall of the Republic. All right, and that leaves one book, and this is kind of a Roman-ish book. Um, and it's The Poison King of the Life and Legend of Mithridates, Rome's Deadliest Enemy by Adrian Mayer. And the reason I say it's kind of a Roman-ish book is even, uh, obviously Mithridates was not a Roman, uh, he probably was one of the biggest, probably the biggest threat to Rome, uh, just a few, gen like a generation or so before uh, the era of the death of Caesar, if that, that's kind of like an interesting uh, kind of comparison, I guess. And even though Mithridates is uh, the king of Pontus, obviously by being Pontus during like the classical era of the, the fall of the Roman Republic, it's got a lot of Roman history 
in it, obviously. Uh, but what's really cool is this is the only biography that I or I know of in English on Mithridates, and he's just like a really cool just figure from the ancient world. There definitely should be like a prime time like HBO show or something on just sort of the life of Mithridates VI Eupator. Um, it would just be really cool. Uh, he's known as the Poison King, uh, the title of this book, essentially because he was like obsessed with like alchemy um, and like pharmaceuticals and stuff. And he definitely uh, imbibed in poisonous substances throughout his life, uh, sort of to bring up his immunity from assassination attempts from poisons. And that is definitely like um, a true thing that is sort of uh, discussed quite a bit on the different sort of... Uh, chemical compounds that he probably digested and everything. And also the Mithridatic, like, panacea was, like, sort of a medieval cure-all thing that people were trying to, like, recreate um, that would cure, like, all kinds of illnesses and stuff. Um, well, what's interesting, too, about Mithridates is he definitely was one of Rome's greatest enemies, especially during the fall of the Republic. There were sort of Mithridates on the Eastern Front with uh, Pontus trying, he essentially wanted to try and create a, like an Eastern counterweight to the Roman, pretty much the Roman Empire um, and everything but name. Uh, so he just sort of wanted like an Eastern Empire that would sort of balance things out. Uh, but at, during this time, there's Mithridates, um, there's Quintus Sertorius in Spain doing his sort of um, insurrection rebellion at the same time. And then even for a brief period, Spartacus and his slave revolt was happening as well in the Italian peninsula. So I always kind of like to wonder if they sort of would have been able to like sort of, sort of, I just said sort of like five times in like a row. Um, if they were able to, s <laughs> I literally almost just did it again. But anyways, um, those three, if they could sort of get together, and, oh my goodness, this was <laughs> just a complete fail. Uh, but anyways, if they could communicate with each other and make some sort of like ungodly alliance, for real and actually coordinate their sort of attacks on Rome. I think that would have been a really interesting turning point in history. Of course, that didn't happen, uh, at least not not to any degree that we can really tell. Uh, but what's really cool too about Mithridates is even though um, he sort of know, he's known as Mithridates the Great, uh, probably the greatest king of Pontus uh, in fighting the Romans, he literally um, made a whole, his whole career fighting the Romans in uh, three or four major uh, wars against the Roman Republic. Uh, I mean, he fought, let's see, he fought, let's see, Sulla, Lucullus, and Pompey, uh, Pompey the Great. So he definitely fought some big names too, as well, not just like some random pushovers that no one's ever heard of. And actually, it's almost his own people that brought him down uh, after his charisma finally gave out after just, you know, decades and decades of civil strife and war and everything. Uh, the people sort of just like turned against him after a while. But like, what makes him cool is he really wasn't the greatest like tactician or strategist per se, especially like on the battlefield. However, it was like I was kind of mentioning earlier, his charisma was so great that every time he got knocked down, he would always found a way to sort of just like slip away and like live to fight another day and always just like rebuild his power base. And uh, for most of the most of uh, the time of his reign, the people really did uh, love him. He was also known for uh, a really giant, a really giant, yeah, a giant Roman massacre. And that's important for uh, several reasons. Basically, it was the logistical way that he was able to coordinate an entire, like, um, execution of Roman, like, merchants and prominent citizens and stuff um, in his kingdom all on the same day throughout his entire um, realm. Logistically, in you know, the, what, first century, first or second century BC, that's a pretty insane um, feat, if you really think about it, uh, getting that all accomplished without it being discovered beforehand, uh, but also having basically uh, just the boldness to actually carry that out, knowing the repercussions that was going to happen. Um, I just thought it was, you know, Mithridates is just a really interesting figure in a definitely, definitely, uh, kind of like an underdog who needs more light shed on him and his sort of, basically his whole reign in the sort of the kingdom of Pontus sort of in general. But anyways, that's part of, that's pretty much why I love uh, The Poison Gang. This book also has really good resources, lots of good cited material, bibliographies and stuff, as well as um, some colored plates and everything. 
um, some illustrations if I can. And I can't remember if there's maps in this one or not off the top of my head. I'm sure there are some. Um, but like I said, just, this one, this edition is just like a really high quality book and everything. And I just really enjoyed reading about my three days. Love finding books that are on sort of niche subjects or uh, topics or characters or events that are um, sort of glossed over a lot of the time and just like really good examinations of uh, these figures. So like, as you can see with my three books, uh, you know, just a topical history of the gladiators, um, a book not necessarily on Julius Caesar, but just on the event of his assassination, and then a biography of Mithridates uh, Eupator. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, definitely my favorite classical history book of 2018 right here and I need to pick up some of her other uh, works as they sound really interesting so there you guys have it those are the three fate my three favorite books on the classical era from 2018 or actually no, they're not from 2018 but that I actually read in 2018 so like I said give me some recommendations if you have any on you know Greco-Roman Celtic uh and you know, barbarian uh uh, type books, I guess, uh, that are his uh, historical nonfiction. I would definitely be glad to check some of them out. Uh, but yeah, whatever you guys um, read, even if you don't read classical history, don't enjoy it. Whatever you guys do read, always remember, read victoriously.